Um, yeah, so you want to go take your seat. Hello, hello. Yeah, just please grab your seat. Hello, everyone again. So, well, just uh, I wanted to share with you that this is a very special moment for me and uh, a very historical moment, I think, for Game Lab. Uh, um, we have the enormous pleasure and honor of having here two people that uh, basically have uh, some of the most amazing stories in games together. Um, we have Sean Layden, there is the chairman of Worldwide Studios uh, for Sony PlayStation. Basically, that means that he overlooks and he's in charge of all the amazing development, game development Sony is doing in, I think, 13 studios. Is it 13 studios around the world? 13, yeah, that's 13 right. studios yeah. around the world. So, all those big God of War, uh, Horizon Zero Dawn, etc., games that you know from Sony, they are in charge uh, of that man here. And on the other side of the ring, <laughs> we have our friend um, Mark Cerny, that you know him very well because he was uh, uh, here with us a few years ago and he's a very well-known profile. That is the guy that knows more about hardware and software and many other things in games with a tremendous career, as you know. And um, I want to thank you, Mark, for helping me, helping me so much, for being such a good friend and advisor behind the curtains for many years, but also this year especially for helping me bring in Sean here. You're very and, welcome. And also Amy here. It's a great honor, and Angie and, and some other people. So uh, I leave you with them. They have like a very uh, interesting uh, um, conversation. Uh, I hope you enjoy it because some of the things these two people have lived and Sean has been through in these uh, many years working with Sony are very surprising and amazing and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. So thank you very much and please give, uh, give a big applause to them to welcome to Sean Layden and Martin. Well, I'm uh, very happy to be able to host this uh, fireside chat today. I think most of you think of Sean, perhaps, as the guy who gets up stage at E3, perhaps in a Crash Bandicoot t-shirt, <laughs> perhaps in something else, and talks about the upcoming games. Right. Uh, and of course, Sean does that in his role as chairman of the Worldwide Studios. So, as uh, Yvonne was saying, two or 3,000 developers report to Sean. But there's this whole other story that hasn't really been told. Sean's been uh, at Sony for over 30 years. Uh, he has an incredibly diverse background, perhaps the most diverse background in PlayStation. Uh, he's worked in uh, Europe, in the States, in Japan. He's uh, worked on the business side, the game side, the network side. And so just to jump right into it, uh, what was your first role at Sony? How did you get into the company? What year was that? That was another century, I think. Yes, it was. Uh, it was the last century. Thank you, Mark, uh, for the introduction. And and thank you, everyone here, for coming out to, to Game Lab. This is a fantastic event. It's, it's my first time to attend, but I know it won't be my last time. Uh, Yvonne's a great host, and the team working here are fabulous. Uh, I began my career in Sony um, in 1987, uh, part of the teenage intern program. I was eight years old. And, uh, uh, no, but it was one of my first jobs out of college. And uh, I joined Sony in 87 and went into their um, uh, corporate headquarters directly into Tokyo. Uh, because the only saleable skill I learned in college was to speak Japanese. And uh, that allowed me to get a job in Tokyo, in Japan, working in corporate communications for Sony when the company was transforming itself from being simply a consumer electronics company but breaking into the entertainment business. Um, shortly after joining, um, the company bought CBS Records uh, out of New York. And then uh, about 12 months later, the company bought Columbia Pictures uh, to bring both bits of that uh, entertainment software into their control, trying to create a synergistic program around creating audio and video equipment and also holding audio and video content. Uh, it was a brave move by Sony, and I think Sony remains now still the only company that really is deeply invested both in entertainment and in electronics. But I stayed there probably for, uh, I was in the corporate gig until 1996, 
and in 1996, um, the company, uh, I was friends with the guy who was the president of the new uh, Sony Computer Entertainment division, and he was looking to boast on it, you know, build out his teams, and he asked me to jump over and um, get into the video game business. And I did tell them truthfully at the time, I said, look, uh, you know, I've been in corporate for the last nine years, I don't know anything about video games, really, other than that I play them and I love them. And he said, that's okay, Sean, nobody knows anything either, so you won't be the only guy. Because Sony was just starting out in the gaming business at that time, and um, been, with, been with PlayStation ever since. So when you started, uh, I believe you were working directly with Akio Moret, uh, Moreta, the, the uh, co-founder of Sony. Is that right? Right. After we did the, uh, I did my corporate communications gig for about three years, um, and we bought, as I said, the, the record in the movie company. Uh, the founder of Sony, a gentleman named Akio Morita, uh, asked me to be his secretary. And, uh, well, he has 14 secretaries, so it wasn't, you know, that special a gig. Um, but yes, I did work for him as his uh, speechwriter and his international aide, and uh, spent five years uh, going around the world with him, and uh, it, was, it was a fantastic experience. Uh, but that put me in a position then to, um, when the video game opportunity came around, Moita san sadly had, had fallen ill and was no longer the CEO of Sony, and so it was time for me to transition to something else, and uh, PlayStation provided that opportunity. In 96? 96, yes. 96. Yes, that was 1996. Uh, I remember I joined in May of 96, and I'd been in PlayStation for only about five days, and my boss at the time came over and said to me, so Sean, are you going to E3? I said, well, should I go to E3? Yeah, yeah, you need to go to E3. I said, great, I'll, I'll take care of that, fine. I turned to one of my colleagues, and of course I had to ask the question, hey, what's E3? <laughs> he said, it's this big show in Los Angeles. Okay, when is that? Uh, next Monday. How do I order a plane ticket? So I had to find out all these things in a matter of 48 hours to get myself to E3 in 1996. And um, that's when my roller coaster ride uh, through gaming began. It was, yeah. it was crazy times back then. Well, your challenge, uh, if I understand it, for the first four years was to sell Western games in Japan. Oh, God. It was like, so what, what could go wrong? <laughs> yeah. Those of you who are old enough, for those of you who have read history, there was a platform called PlayStation 1. And at that time, the Japanese developers were just crushing it. Games like Tekken and Ridge Racer and, and Toshinden and, of course, Final Fantasy VII. Um, I had the job in Tokyo of bringing Western games and bringing them to the Japanese market. You know, trying to walk up to, to gamers in Japan and say, forget Tekken, you want Mortal Kombat. Uh, you know, forget Ridge Racer, you want Destruction Derby. Uh, it, was a, it was a hard slog, you know. I, I say this as no offense to my European and American counterparts who actually made those games and made a fortune in those countries, but bringing it to Japan was impossible. Uh, Western games there just could not catch on. Probably the biggest selling Western game I was able to work on when I was in Japan was Formula One, because Japan is a huge Formula One uh, fan base. But even that was only 500,000 years. Well, I mean, that broke the rules, right? Because what everybody said was that no Western title could sell more than 200,000 units in Japan. Uh, most of my Western titles couldn't sell 30,000 units in Japan. So. Uh, yes, you're right, except um, probably the most successful Western title on PlayStation 1, and it came through our shop, and it was immediately taken away from my international software group and pulled into the standard Japanese production group. This one title, this one little title called Crash Bandicoot. Yeah, uh, we wanted to do that one out of my, out of my team, but uh, this guy named Shu Yoshida snatched it off our desk and uh, took it into the... Uh, into the standard domestic production house. That's why even today, a lot of Japanese gamers think Crash Bandicoot was made in Japan. The localization job they did on it was, was just incredible. Naughty Dog were fantastic developers. Of course, my colleague here, Mark Cerny, was deeply involved in the original Crash, and that's where we met. I thought we met on Jack, no, Crash. We met on Crash when you came Crash. to Japan to pick up an award. Yes, and met Kojima at the award ceremony, in fact. Correct, yes. 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 So all these roads come back like that, yes. yes. Uh, but like I said earlier, DeMar, we're not old, we're vintage. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's put that in the stories here. I think also um, another challenge was QA, right? So oh, Japanese God. QA, so tough. <laughs> Kick the game back. And some of the, some of the titles from the U.S. and Europe simply couldn't, could not be released to market. Right, because this is, you know, PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2, remember, these are not network-enabled platforms. So there was no patching your game. It had to be perfect and, and rock solid when you print, when you went to print. And um, of course, as all things you'd imagine, the Japanese QA is more rigorous, more intensive, more pedantic uh, than the rest of the world. 
wasn't there that one bug like PlayStation 2 that if the if the disc would you know accidentally engage the drive and they say well, the drive could come out and if you had a cup of coffee there it would be knocked over and you could hurt yourself. And that was logged that, that's a bug. Bug. yeah, the total fail. So uh, no, it was, it was those are crazy times uh, for PS1 and PS2. Also, um, and I think you probably have the same thing that, that I have occasionally, which is um, not everybody looks at you and thinks, here's a man who can speak Japanese. <laughs> but that, that mean that might have, um, was that more of a, a thing when you were working in Tokyo or more of a thing after you went to Europe where you'd be in meetings and the Japanese would, would be talking freely? Well, sure. In, you. In, in, in Japan, I guess there was an expectation. I was working in a Japanese company and we're in Japan, so everyone speaks Japanese and if you couldn't keep up, you couldn't keep up. Um, but when I moved to London in 1999, uh, we had just completed the purchase of a, a famous UK uh, developer called Cygnosis. And so I transferred to London in 99 to work with the dev teams and to work with the Cygnosis teams on coming into the, the, the Sony fold, so to speak. And um, I was also, at that time, so I was in Europe, I did the opposite thing, trying to bring Japanese games into the European market. A lot easier, trust me, than bringing European games to Japan. Um, but, you know, the negotiations are hard, and uh, they bring people over. And I won't name the developer or the publisher we were working with, but they were trying to try to negotiate a royalty deal for, for a game and try to get the percentages right. And you know, the negotiations that go on and on. And the two gentlemen on the other side of the table whisper to each other in Japanese. The, the, the translation would be, okay, tell them 27. We'll take 25, but tell them 27. And, uh, and so we finally got them down to 25. <laughs> and as I walked into the elevator, as they closed, I gave them a nice Japanese thank you and for all the time and the trouble. And the guys kind of like, like, like dogs that tickled their head like that. Um, but you can only pull that trick once, then it became why we know. And then they know. Yeah, it's yeah. true. Then yeah. you're busted. Yeah, then you're busted. But that was a great time in the 90s. All of these, all of these teams and people that are household names today were just getting into the business. Like yeah. um, Andy and Jason on mm -hmm. that Naughty Dog. Back when Naughty Dog was, uh, I think you met them when they were uh, seven people. I met them when they were two people. <laughs> right. Or um, back when games only cost a million dollars to make. We well, well, we were yeah we were making incredibly expensive games for yes under two million. Right. Right. Oh, or um, your first meeting maybe with Sucker Punch when they had their little cabin in the woods. Oh yeah. In that first office. Yeah. Those those crazy uh, Microsoft refugees that created Sucker Punch and uh, they had some cabin out in the woods and. You, had to drive down past like the old mill house and you know turn down the road with no name. Yeah, well, you're all hearing Microsoft. It wasn't Microsoft Games. Microsoft wasn't in the games. It wasn't games. It, it was right. Microsoft Office that they were working right. on. Right, right. They escaped and Excel. they decided to escape yeah. and yeah. found a little game developer yeah. in a cabin in the woods. Yeah, and they had this game about a thieving raccoon, which uh, which we jumped on and became part of that, and it was fabulous. Or uh, Insomniac when it was just. Uh, Ted Price and the Hastings brothers. And the Hastings brothers, yes. 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 And Spyro. And that's, what, that's when you worked with them, right? That's when you, yes. you discovered yes. them. Um, Disruptor. Yes. And Disruptor, Disru yes. Disruptor, yes. Yeah, it's first person shooter. Pretty good. Um, or I and now, now they're working on this, this game. So. On that, yes, it's true. Yeah, and branding. You may have heard of that. Yeah. yeah. You will be hearing of that. Uh, or, oh gosh, Gorilla. Now, Gorilla, when you started working with them, they were already Gorilla? Were they Lost Boys? Or had they made the oh. transition? Were they still in Lost Boys? And they were working on a sure. title called Kin. It was called Kin. Kin. Right. And we looked at that, and um, very, very charismatic, the Gorilla people. I say that because one of them is here with us tonight. Uh, and uh, it, it was a, a great shop. You could see their potential. And uh, they had a fantastic first-person shooter called Kin that we couldn't get that trademark, so it became Killzone. Killzone. Yeah. Or uh, a couple boys in Guildford. Uh, oh, oh. Who, who had um, a, Alex a Craft World. Yeah, well, not just boys, of course. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this, this little shop uh, in Guildford, um, uh, I guess they had either escaped uh, Peter Molyneux's empire or, or something out of EA. And, uh, they they had a, yarn a, rendering? They, they had a little yarn game called, called Craft, Craft World, which, which had yarn and foam technology, where they could render that. And um, we saw that. Um, honestly, couldn't figure out really what the demo was, but it looked uh, awesome, and the teams were very inspirational and inspiring. Uh, and we got behind that project too, and uh, now Media Molecule, you know, they've turned that game into Little Big Planet, which is known, known and loved all around the world. And Dreams, their latest title, uh, which they're uh, making progress on, um, continues that tradition of, of giving tools to gamers to make their own games. It's fabulous stuff.
But uh, yeah, I've had a chance to meet all different teams. I worked with, with Sega closely when they gave up on the Dreamcast and moved over to, to PlayStation 2. Right, well, you were the, um, the business side then. Uh, so I was still on the development side. But, but for them, you, you, for them they, was, you would replace their local publisher. Yes, we became their publisher in Europe. Yeah. So that was an interesting you know, secret meeting we had to have that discussion and, and work that out before they announced it. So uh, it's been a crazy ride. I spent the first third of my career in Japan. Then I spent nine years in London and then went back to Japan. I remember it was in 2007. I, I've, been in, I've been in Europe for about eight and a half years. And when you're an expatriate working for a company like Sony, you usually get three to five years as your assignment because they don't want you to go native, right? So after three years, you typically say, you know, it's going really well, but I think I need to stay a little bit longer. After five years, you go, yeah, I think it's going really well. And um, I'll call you if I need to come back. And uh, you, try to, you try to dip below the radar so no one finds you. Um, but well, I remember, before you get to getting called back. Getting called back, yeah. Before you, um, so um, Worldwide Studios was also getting started in those days. That's right. That's right. We, um, Difficult to believe, but we had completely independent game creation operations in three territories, each uh, with their own core philosophies, management structures, mm -hmm. um, goals for and relationships with the publishing groups. Sure. And then get a tap on the shoulder around 2005, 2006. Things are changing. Right. So we started Worldwide Studios in 2005. Five. And that's where we took all of our, our three regional structures and tied them all up. Because by 2005, we'd been in the game business for about 10 years. And the cost of production was already escalating. You know, those $2 million game days were already over by 2005. Well, those $2 million games, yeah, they were then 10. But yes. Right. So they doubled. They're very expensive. Yes. And... We realized that we couldn't maintain this tripartite um, uh, division structure because n no singular region could get enough critical mass to compete with Electronic Arts or Square Enix or, 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 or Sega or any of those companies. So we created Worldwide Studios in 2005 in order to bring all of these, as Yvonne said, we now have 13 studios worldwide. And this kind of structure allows us to compete at a global level and gives you, in the end, you know, games like Gran Turismo and, uh, and God of War. And and, and Horizon Zero Dawn. So that was in 2005, and I was still in London at the time. And then 2007, right, is when I get the phone call from uh, the CEO of SCEI. Uh, I'm standing on the train platform in Liverpool, England, and my cell phone goes off, and the, the woman says, um, please hold for the CEO. I said, yeah, sure, of course, right. And who says no to that? Um, and then there was, there was Kaz asking me, so Sean, uh, how are you? Oh, great, thanks. Good, good to hear from you, Kaz. How are you doing? Uh, how long have you been in England anyway? And now, you know, when you become CEO, you never ask a question unless you already know the answer. So, so when he was asking me that question, I, I'm sure he's got my file right in front of him. And I said, um, eight years, nine months, and about 46 days. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. It's time for you to come back to Japan. And I said, ah, ah. It's, I think there's a lot of good work for me to do here in the UK and England. It's really important. No, I think it's time for you to come back to Japan. And I said, okay. But Ken, if I come back to Japan, then what am I going to do? Because he already had a head of studios uh, in Japan, a guy at the time named Kobayashi, who I worked closely with. But I didn't know what kind of job he wanted me to do. And he said, Sean, I want you to come back to Japan and be president of SC Japan. The business unit. The business unit. And I'd been in game production only up until this time. And I, and I just started laughing, standing on the train platform with the CEO and my phone. And he um, said, so what are you laughing about? I said, Kaz. Kaz, you got to tell me. What, what? How bad is the situation if you think bringing a game producer from London back to Japan to run domestic sales and marketing sounds like a good idea to you? Uh, and Kaz was very honest and straightforward. He said, you couldn't make it any worse. Um, <laughs> we had just launched PlayStation 3, and every territory was struggling, Japan especially so, um, in, getting, uh, in getting support for the platform and, and getting retailers to get behind it. Um, we needed to have a bit of a shakeup in the culture at the SC Japan offices. And so in October of 2007, I sadly left jolly old England and uh, moved back to Japan for my first job in sales and marketing in my entire life. And the job, I mean, if I understand it, is retail, right? You're selling games to retail. Oh, which God. means, I mean, what's the meeting? The meeting is drinks in the morning with the head <laughs> of a department chain to get the latest game stocked, right? That's Japanese business. Yeah, and then you do the journos, and then you have to sit with customer service in the afternoon, and then um, you work with the third-party developers who 
had always been like competitors for me, but now they're partners on the platform and making sure that they support PlayStation 3. And uh, it was going to the retailers was the really hard part. I mean, going out to meet with the president of you know, Yodobashi Camera or Yamada Denki and then um, having them beat up on me because they didn't like the PS3 business model. Um, I, I learned a lot about retailing really fast uh, in a second language. Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, but uh, but we, did, we did well. We, uh, we were successful in my first 18 months of sales and marketing in Japan. Uh, I would like to say it was because of my success with PS3, but actually it was because of my success with PSP. And the PSP success in Japan at that time was almost entirely based on Monster Hunter. Um, Monster Hunter was a great game for our PSP business in Japan. Capcom was, it remains a great partner for us. But the beauty of Monster Hunter is that in order to really complete the game, you had to do it with three friends. So you had to have teams of four. So like every sale engendered three more sales um, to get your friends together to play. It's a good model. It was a great model, yeah. Yeah, PSP was very, very good to me during my time at SCJ. So I mean, what was that like trying to sell? I mean, PS3 was tricky in every country for us. Mm. We'd, I mean, PS1, we'd been the uh, sort of the spunky upstart and then PlayStation 2, uh, one through and getting a real um, just tremendous brand following and then PlayStation 3. Uh, super computer on super a chip. Super computer on a chip, yeah. Uh, you know, there's some ways you can look at the rise, the, the, the legacy of PlayStation. Sometimes it reads like a Greek drama, right? PlayStation comes out of nowhere. It's the little kid from the forest who comes into the big city, and there's these two titans of Sega and Nintendo who are running everything. Um, and PlayStation finds a way to be successful. And it finds a way to get a lot of partners onto the platform and bring out great games and, uh, and really disrupt the gaming market. So then we launch into PlayStation 2, where we come in as leaders, we continue as leaders. Um, some other players drop out of the marketplace. Some try to get in and don't succeed, and the PlayStation 2 sales just rocket. Um, still the biggest selling platform of all time. Um, and then PlayStation 3, you know, sometimes you can go back and look at it and say, that was like our Icarus moment, right? That's when we flew too close to the sun and um, took a bit of a dip in the business, uh, to say the least, um, during the PlayStation 3 era. Only finally, you know, fighting it out to, uh, to parity with uh, Xbox 360 by the end of the life cycle. Um, PlayStation 4 is a story of redemption. It's a time for us to, I think we came back, we had the right, uh, the right hardware specs, thank you very much, and, uh, and we had good support from our partners. I think we got back to our basics about PlayStation being the people's platform and really there to provide something for you know, our third party partners to, to succeed with and reaching out to their fans. Um, and we just try to keep, uh, uh, keep an understanding and keep an appreciation of um, we get here with our fans at the same time. Uh, we succeed in our, in our business uh, with our partners at the same time. So, how many years in Japan? Me? Yes. Uh, it's hard to say, because technically speaking, I still kind of live in Japan. I'm there about half, half oh, of my uh, time. How many, years, how many years running the RHQ? Oh, running the RHQ? Three years. Three years. And at that point, you still, as an American, never worked in America for Sony. I still hadn't worked in America since, uh, since Reagan was president. Yeah. And then you get a call. Right. And so there's another call, same guy, Kaz, who says to me, this is 2009, late 2009. And he goes, hey, Sean, um, you know, PS3, the network, PSN, we're doing a lot of stuff around that. And I said, yeah. He said, well, remember how you told me that you know, we just need to focus on the network business to make it grow? I said, yeah, that's true. So, well, we're going to start this new company called Sony Network Entertainment. We're going to start it up in the Bay Area. Um, we've got this guy named Tim Schaff, who's former Apple guy, and he'll be the president of that company. We want you to go over there and be the chief operating officer. I said, uh, yeah, when, when is this happening? He said, as soon as you can go. Okay, right. Well, um, I, I think the pattern you see here is that I just kind of built my career out of always saying yes when people ask me to do something. Um, but at that time, we just moved back from London three years earlier, and my kids were still grieving that they had to leave all their friends in London to move, to move back to Tokyo. And um, so when I went home that night and talked to my wife about it. Um, uh, it's just like being in the military, right? It's like being in the military, yeah, except... Different uh, base every year or two. Yes, except it's like being in the military, except my wife's the general, not me. So, <laughs> so, 
So she decided that I would go to the outpost of San Francisco, uh, and uh, I come back to Tokyo about seven to ten days every month. So, and um, also though, in uh, Sony Network Entertainment, that mm -hmm. sort of uh, a little bit of a step outside of games, because Sony Network Entertainment was not just games, right? That's that's right. also movies and TV. Um, it's a more general service that you're trying to build. Right. I think the premise for Sony Network Entertainment at, at the get-go was really, you know, at that time, every bit of Sony was kind of spitting up its own online presence, its own network service. And so we were putting the, putting the burden on the, on the user to, okay, you go create your Sony PlayStation relationship and go over here and create your Sony Bravia TV relationship and go over here and create your CyberShot relationship. So we're putting the burden on the consumer to create eight, nine, ten different relationships with Sony in order to enjoy our products and our services. So by creating Sony Network Entertainment, we wanted to capture all that activity in one place, create a Sony Network Entertainment presence, and then channel people through that into the other bits of Sony. Well, that was the theory anyway. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but in the end, by and large, that relationship was built around PlayStation. At the time, we had our own streaming video services. We still do. Uh, we also had our own streaming music service, which we still, which we don't. We got out of that one. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, music Unlimited. We did that for about uh, three painful years. Uh, trust me, they were really painful. Uh, streaming music is a hard business. Ask the guys at Spotify. I think they just only manage it by just growing all the time. Um, we decided we would partner with Spotify and bring them onto the platform. At the time, we were the exclusive console partner for Spotify and helped them grow and help bring music to our services. So we'd still like the PlayStation to be a place where you can realize you know, all, of your, all of your entertainment activities. We like to think people will game 24 hours a day, but we know sometimes they watch TV or listen to music or, or, or watch a film. Um, we just like to keep you in the world of PlayStation so you can do all of that. And so about three years? Uh, 2010 to 2014. Four years. Four years. And you get a call, but what's different is it's not cause. It's not cause, it's, it's Andy. Andy, Andy it's House. Andy, Andy yes. House. Andy Hess, and he calls with a pitch for you. With a pitch yes. saying, "Sean, great work for the network stuff. Uh, we got a new job for you." And I said, okay, what is it now? Uh, we wanted you to move over and be president of SCEA uh, because Jack was stepping down, um, and so that's what got me on the stage at E3 in 2014 for the first time. And then that's huge. I mean, that's a business unit that must represent what hunk of the revenue of uh, PlayStation. Probably in excess of 40%. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of money. But you, you, you've done that's the trial run in Japan. So. <laughs> the trial run in Japan. Uh, American retailers are just as doggedly aggressive as Japanese retailers, so same, same on that. Um, our partners in development across the platform. Um, it's interesting, you know, really across PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4, that was a time when, when, the, when the Western development community really rose up uh, in, their, uh, in their quality and in their standards. And in fact, a lot of the Japanese did all of this, I think, had a rough start in the transition from PS2 to PS3 and even over to PS4. I mean, just the last 18 months, we're starting to see the Japanese development community really come back strong on PS4. Um, but, um, but PS3, PS4 has been very good for, for American developers, Activision, EA, Take-Two, Warner Brothers. Um, and so working with them as partners uh, was an important part of that business as well. And that all came to an end uh, in April. Well, but then you got the call in 2017 first, right? 2016? 2016. 2016, the call is? Can you, do, can you take on another job? And can you be the president of SCA and also be the chairman of Worldwide Studio? I did ask if that came with two paychecks, but the answer to that was no. Uh, but um, so I did that for a couple of years, and now as of April, we've changed the structure a bit. We've globalized all sales and marketing uh, under Jim Ryan the deputy president who works out in London. And I've just now managed, since, uh, since April anyway, to focus my efforts and my attentions on, on growing the Worldwide Studios. About 22 years. You did the math at that the fast? Doing the math, at the end of which, yes, chairman of Worldwide Studios. Yeah. So, you know, if you're, in Japan they have this thing called Stamp Rally. Do you guys know what that is? It's like you go to a theme park or you go to some place and at every temple you get a stamp on your card and kids want to collect them all. And so I think I've won the PlayStation stamp rally. I think I've worked at every possible company you know, inside PlayStation, some which don't even exist anymore. Uh, I think Andy House was giving you a really good run for your money um, before he resigned. Because he'd also done, he'd done the Grand Tour, right? He'd done the States, he'd done Europe, he'd done Japan. He hadn't done the network company. 
He hadn't. That's and true. he hadn't done Worldwide Studio. I said he was giving a run for, for your money. Yeah, it was his close. Yeah. So, um, Worldwide Studios. So, uh, what... Here's a leading question. What makes the Worldwide Studio so special? What makes them so special? I think, I think for a lot of reasons, and you, you, know, you know us from our games, you may not know that you know, my same studio structure that brings you Gran Turismo is the one that also brings you The Last of Us, which also brings you Horizon Zero Dawn and Detroit Become Human, and soon upcoming this game, Spider-Man. Uh, so we have the 13 studios worldwide. I think one of the things that makes our structure a bit unique, uh, and I challenge anyone to, to, uh, to argue my claim, is that um, we're the only studio structure I know of that can create AAA content in three regions. We can make it in Japan, we can create it in Europe, we can create it in America. Um, I think that gives us a certain energy, a certain power, certainly a, a widened viewpoint about markets worldwide and gamers, and I think that's a, a, a benefit to all of the studios. Um, we have 13 studios, we have probably 2,500, 3,000 people maybe, um, and we have a lot of external partners that we work with, whether it be Insomniac, again, I'm pushing the Spider-Man name, uh, and um, uh, it's Omniac or, or Quantic Dream or, or Supermassive. So we have a lot of partners that we work with. Um, so I think our breadth is really wide. I think the other thing that makes Worldwide Studios special is uh, we put a lot of energy and time and dedication into storytelling. We like the big story. We like to tell the narrative. We want to make people think and laugh and cry and really get to know our characters and our worlds that we create. And um, Hope that you want to live in those worlds for a long time and, and, and listen to the stories that the characters have to tell. Um, for us, our entertainment medium really is about can we, can we move you? Can we get you to, uh, to have a new thought, to, to see a new thing? Um, I think that's what really, if you look at all of our, all of our games at Worldwide Studios, that's probably the one thing that knits us all together. Another dynamic we, we definitely have is every game for the studio is a passion project. It was great talk hearing uh, Maya talk this morning about mm -hmm. Cuphead, I mean, you, there's something that you want to make, mm -hmm. and uh, that, that energy and that passion really helps you make uh, a much better game. But at the same time, all of that somehow on a business level needs to slot into, I mean, there's hardware, right. uh, there's a marketing organization that um, is at its most efficient when there's a steady line, um, steady series of products going out in the marketplace, and so somehow have to have portfolio plan and a philosophy of mm -hmm. what it is that should be made beyond you know, that next game that Naughty Dog is very excited about making. Right. I think you're right that every great game comes from someone's passion and someone's vision. Um, you don't make a great game based on the output of an eight-member committee who you don't even know the names of those people. Um, so at Worldwide Studios and running it globally, um, I thought for a long time what what, what what kind of driving ethos could we create, or, or how would we decide what games you want to do? And since we're working at a global level, I had to make my message as simple as possible. And so I just tried to boil it down to three things. And here, here are the constraints you operate under as a creator. As a creator. At the Worldwide Studio. First, best, or must. The game you're working on has to fulfill at least one of these criteria, preferably two. First means, are you creating a first of its kind sort of game, a genre which doesn't exist, a market that hasn't been actualized yet. Will your game do that? Um, that's kind of an obligation for us too as first party development because we're not here to create games and steal market share from other publishers. Because we manage the platform, it's not to steal pieces of the pie, but it's to grow the entire pie. So first, when you create a new genre like Parappa the Rappa did, Rhythm Action Gaming, who knew that was gonna be a thing? Or SingStar, bringing a microphone into your living room. And soon, coming out of our studios, a game called Concrete Genie, which is a new form of entertainment that we haven't seen before. Um, if you can fulfill that, then that's something that at a worldwide studios level, we're interested in that project. Best is probably the easiest one to, to explain. If you're, if you're best, that means if you're gonna make an action adventure, you better be making Uncharted or God of War. If you're making a racing game, you better be making Gran Turismo. Uh, or golf game, everybody's golf, my favorite golf game. Um, you must be the best in class. If someone came up with a plan that they did all the Excel spreadsheets and they Sean, this is going to make money for us and it's going to be the fourth best racing game ever. I, I've just got no interest in doing the fourth best of anything. 
So um, that wouldn't be something we'd get behind. So we have first, we have best. Uh, must is probably the other thing that reflects to our position as first party development attached to the platform is there are some games that we must do, even if initially the profitability might be hard to make. For example, an easy one for that is, is PlayStation VR games. As you're trying to grow the PlayStation VR install base, we call it, you know, how many units are in homes, um, it's difficult for some third parties to look at that, that addressable market and get the, get the business model to work for them. But we need games to move the platform, and it's the chicken and the egg thing. So at Worldwide Studios, we take on a number of, for example, PSVR projects in order to support the launch of that platform and um, getting it, uh, getting it uh, off the ground. So first, best and must. We look at all of our games through that lens, and it helps us, I think, make you know, the right decision most of the time. This year, definitely some good titles. There's where it's a. Okay. Okay, so now I have two microphones. Um, so, um, what about risk taking? Yeah. Is it is it possible to go out with a? Well, we don't say what we spend on these titles, so I won't quote a number, but a lot. Something yes, well in excess of fifty million dollars. <laughs> I think everybody well would agree on that. Yeah. Is it possible to go ahead and uh, spend that and not know the degree of market that you're going to have for that title? It's difficult. And um, you know, back in the day when, when games were costing you know, $2 million or so, uh, you could probably take 12 or 15 shots on goal to make five. Um, with the price of games going up two orders of magnitude, um, we're looking at we'll probably get to take seven shots on goal to make five. Um, you have to you have to take smarter risks. You have to understand your market better. And oh, we do a lot of research about games before we, we get started, not only technically, but, but market-wise, um, and have different stages throughout the production cycle where you have to decide to go or no-go, go or no-go. Um, you know, green lighting is a tricky part of the business, but sometimes red lighting is the hardest part because you hate to have to tell somebody after they put so much time and so much work in something that it just isn't working and we have to stand that down and do something else. Um, we do in Worldwide Studios have a lot of, I think, scope for that kind of risk taking. Um, and um, it's, not, it's not sort of one strike you're out. You get a chance to, um, to try new projects too, even if you, the one you just worked on or had to stop working on wasn't as successful as you liked it to be. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it's not for the faint of heart, that's for sure. It's true, I mean, I think something like a quarter of the titles that you out there see, um, that isn't the game that the team started making. And sometimes, at some point in the process, somebody quietly taps them on the shoulder and says, it's, it's done very well. It's, it's not you, you have to, but it, you know, maybe you should think about whether or not you really want to take this to the end. Right. Um, because again, the, uh, the cost of entry and the cost of continuation is so high, uh, sometimes you have to take a huge write-off. Um, and then move on quickly and pivot quickly to the next thing. That's true for all developers. That's not just a, you know, specific to us. To everybody here, everyone who's a developer in this room knows what that's like. Um, we're taking bigger bets. We're spending a lot more money. And it's taking more time. You know, more time just to get to proof of technology or proof of concept. You can get you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars into the process before you can actually prove that out. So, but still, games only can cost 60, 60 euros or $60. So... It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a changing business model certainly for the game community. Um, so thirteen studios. How how different is the process depending on studio? How much time do you have? Uh, it's it's quite different, but I think um, as as we work together as a collective, I think uh, our studios, you know, follow the, the same the same trajectory in in, in game development. You know, once we get it started and how we manage that and how we look at milestones and how we prove deliverables. But certainly in the ideation or the inception part, um, it's different from different studios all around. You know, the way that we got to God of War is different than the way we got to Everybody's Golf PS4 is different from you know, how we got the PlayLink titles off the ground. It's, um, it's an eclectic group to say the How least. we're getting to dreams. And how we're getting to dreams, yes. Yes, we will. We're, we're, we're cruising... Uh, we're cruising at altitude with that right now, but uh, I don't have any plans to announce around uh, around release dates. But I think we'll hear more about that later in the year. So that
That's all I had for prepared questions. Um, we could sort of transition out to questions from the audience for the time. Is that good? Yeah, yeah? sure. I'm happy yeah. to do that. Can somebody throw a microphone out there? Mark, how long have you been working with PlayStation? Oh, God. One form or another, 20, 24 years now? Okay. Yeah. It's you're, been a few. You're vintage, too. Yes, we say vintage. Yeah. I mean, in, in games, this is year 37, <laughs> which is very scary. I, I have one question. Okay. Who are you? Uh, I'm uh, Angel Sucasas. I'm from El País, the editor in video games on the Spanish newspaper. Mm -hmm. And my question is, I thought that I have this year at E3, another E3, another year. And that is very connected for what you say just 10 minutes ago about the games are made by someone. They have faces uh, behind them and dreams. So I want to know if you think that maybe the industry could make it better and make more focus, as cinema do with Cannes Festival and, and other things, to take the cultural and authorship of games more, on, more into the light. And of course, we need the big spectacle and fireworks of E3, but maybe we need something else, like uh, the conversation that you are having now here that is more human, more deep, and more interesting. OK, well, thank you for that. Um, we have that in the States, I think. We do this thing in December called PlayStation Experience. And PSX is more of a, uh, uh, we, we, have, we have some presentations, and then we have a lot of panels where developers can come out and, and speak to their products and, and talk about their games in more depth and in, in more detail. There's more of this kind of uh, activity happening at, 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 at PSX. I mean, we were there last December, and it was amazing to sit on stage. I think we had we had Corey Barlog from uh, from uh, God of War. Uh, we had we had Herman Hultz from Horizon. We had Guillaume, whose last name I can't pronounce, from Quantic Dream. Um, and I just saw on stage like five or six or seven, and, and Shabam from uh, Media Molecule, five or six or seven creators right there on stage, um, all coming from Worldwide Studios to talk about their AAA games that they're working on, and in more detail and kind of in more of this format. So. I still think E3 is, by and large, it's a trade show. And it's there for the big um, sales and marketing push around your titles going into the holiday period. Um, so I, I agree with you. We, should, we need to find more places. I think Game Lab is now one of the places where we can have the more human conversation. Thank you so much. Not to, not to jump in. Please but, do. Um, you know, I think we're seeing a bit of an evolution. When I, when I started in games, uh, in, this was the arcade games back in 1982, um, not only were the creators not leading the story about the, the game, but we were forbidden to talk about our work. It was, it was crazy. So you'd, you'd work in the lab, and you'd create something like Asteroids, and you were forbidden by the company to ever mention publicly in any context, even to your family, if you read your contract, that you had anything to do with that game. Uh, but you know, as some consolation, you could put your name, your initials in the credits. <laughs> uh, that, that was all you got. And uh, that policy ended in 1983, thank God. And I think we're doing much better about bringing the creators forward. I think we still have a lot of way to go. Um, it, was, it was wonderful to hear um, Ubisoft not only talking, bringing their creators all on stage at the press conference this year. I go every year, it's a blast. But they're even talking about involving gamers in the actual process of developing the game. Is if shocking, but no. If you want to compose a piece of music oh. for Beyond e Good and Evil Two, uh, if you want to design a character, is they're creating a pipeline for bringing mm -hmm. gamers who want to be collaborative with their oh, that'd be cool. uh, with their directors and their teams into the process. So I, I think it's going to be really fun next ten or twenty years as we figure out the logistics about how we can be just more free and open about this process. Wasn't that also one of the innovations when PlayStation entered the business in 1994 is we actually put the developer's logo on the front of the box. Right? You had Naughty Dog logo on the front of... of, of, of yeah, it's, it's really shifting towards developer-driven PR. Right. But it is still true that the game 
is somewhat a, the creation somewhat of a black box until that first E3 or until um, until uh, it goes on on sale. Right. And so it's going to be very interesting seeing how that all happens and, uh, differently well, in the future. Well, especially if we have this sort of you know, collective consciousness of, of game lovers and, and game creators working it together. Or I should say, Death Stranding. You know, if you're on, if you're following Kojima's uh, Kojima Sans Twitter field feed, you probably have a pretty good idea about what they're doing on the project. Yeah, that's the only way I can ever find out is from his Twitter feed. Basically, so, yeah. <laughs> Sean, um, Dean. So uh, I, I kind of want to reconcile the, this this story about the numbers of developers with uh, having the right developers as well. Like uh, Ubisoft talks about how it has twelve thousand developers. Mm -hmm. And then once upon a time, Sony had twice as many developers as Microsoft, and you could sort of predict that uh, the outcome was going to be better for Sony in the games business because of that. Okay? Um, but you also make this big deal about having just Hideo Kojima, um, you know, as you know, a single developer on your side, making a big difference in, in the console war, or, you know, the ho the overall business. Uh, how how do you look at that? Like whether you know, you need to have the most developers in order to win, or, you know, just having this right set of developers? Well, I guess it depends on whether the question is, what is world, how big does Worldwide Studios need to be? And the que other question, the mention of that is, you know, for PlayStation, how big? Do you need a third microphone? Do I need a third yeah. microphone? Yes. <laughs> um, I think, I think for Worldwide Studios right now, and our, our output, the number of teams we have, I think is about the right size for what we need to do. We're never going to be like Nintendo, you know, holding the lion's share of the Nintendo uh, platform uh, uh, game business, uh, because that's not the way we work. We want to really make the, uh, the PlayStation platform available to all of our third-party partners. So I think we build success for PlayStation by getting as many people inside the tent as possible that aren't necessarily controlled by Worldwide Studios. And again, I think for Worldwide Studios, our road to success is not necessarily about how many studios or how many people I have. It's are we creating you know, significant, impactful, important content that is either first best or, 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 or must have products. So um, I don't really think it's a, it's, it's a numbers game like that. Hello, right up at the back here. There we go, right back here. Oh. Hello, thank you very much uh, for your talk. I thought it was fascinating uh, you talking about PlayStation 3 flying uh, too close to the sun, your Icarus moment, you called it, and then PlayStation 4 coming back uh, to be more, back to basics, to be more about the players. Um, but there seems to be an issue at the moment that Sony isn't listening to its players, or doesn't seem to be, um, and that's cross-play, um, Fortnite particularly. And I wondered um, if there are any plans to open it up. It seems to be Sony's not listening. Okay, I've got, uh, Rob, I've got one short statement on that. Rob. It's okay, you know. Um, we're hearing it. We're looking at a lot of the possibilities. You can imagine that the, the circumstances around that affect a lot more than just one game. And um, I'm confident that we'll get to a solution uh, which will be understood and accepted by our gaming community at the same time supporting our business. Thank um, you. Hi. Hello. Hello. I would like to ask you about uh, catalog games. Uh, I mean, many publishers uh, now have a bigger, a bigger uh, percentage of their revenue coming from games released in previous uh, fiscal years. So uh, they try to bring back all the games. I think we're we'll about uh, to hear which game he'd like. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I am going to suggest to you uh, to include the Bike Wars compatibility for next PlayStation, in addition to, to help in future uh, services like PlayStation Now and so on. Uh, so, this is, this is not a pitch for Jack and Daxter on. <laughs> No? 
because the idea is for Worldwide Studios. Uh, will help. <laughs> I mean that uh, for m many publishers it uh, it helps to have a stronger catalog uh, sorry <laughs> I don't know how to yeah I think I, I think I you know generally get you get your point about you know finding a way to resurface uh, previous content older content in ways that new people can enjoy it um, perhaps uh, crash band crash band you just name one um, I think that's partly around our PlayStation Now service, which allows you to experience all the great PS3 games that you either want to relive again or maybe didn't see the first time. It also takes publishers like ourselves to look at, you know, great games, truly great games, are still great, are always great. And um, so we've gone back in our catalog to find out some of our great titles um, that we wanted to bring up to a new audience on PlayStation 4, so we did the Ratchet and Clank a remaster or Shadow of the Colossus. You know, it's interesting, we were looking at Ratchet and Clank, and a lot of us in the studios were saying, well, you know, but everyone's played Ratchet and Clank. We did, the, we, we did a survey, we found out something crazy, like three quarters, at least three quarters of PS4 owners had never played a Ratchet game. Uh, they just never knew it. When you think that's, what, 14 years ago, so it doesn't you know, make sense that they, they wouldn't have been either of the age of majority or even playing games at that time. So we looked strategically 16 at... 16 years ago. 16 years ago, yeah. So Ratchet is, was a new title to a lot of the PS4 community. And that's why it saw such great success. So um, we announced Medieval at PSX last year. We're, we're, we're bringing that one back. Uh, and, um, uh, and Crash Crash is doing great for our friends at Activision. So yes, great games are always great. We do try to find ways to resurface that content and get people access to it. Uh, so you mentioned three categories where a game should fall if it well uh, to be good. You said first best and must. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that best is creating the best of its kind, but I don't see the difference between uh, being the first game because you are innovating, and mm -hmm. must because you you put the example of VR games that you have to create them so other people start developing them. What's the difference uh, from first to must then? I guess maybe must is sometimes driven by a technology. You know, we decided to do VR. We have PSVR technology. We're working on that for over five years, six years. So we've got to the place where the technology is ready to come to market. Oops, we better have some games that, uh, that can help explain why VR is important or what VR can do. And, and so we design games around that technology. First is not technology dependent, per se. If you just have a great idea like, like Parappa um, or Concrete Genie, you can just come out with that. So it's not platform dependent. Have one question here. Well, that's a good question, though. Very thank good, you. thank you. Uh, here, on your right, left. Oh, hi. Um, I would like to ask um, internally, concerning how different is uh, West to Japan, how uh, did you guys live um, internally the, the life cycle, the ups and downs of a PlayStation Vita? And also, knowing that when you wore a t-shirt a year after that game gets announced, I would suggest you wear a Demon Souls t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think I'm going to get a lot of t-shirt recommendations over the next three days. Uh, the, um, yeah, the Vita business, uh, well, the PSP business was very successful in Japan as well. And I think Vita capitalized on that. I think the, uh, the gaming culture in Japan uh, is much stronger around the handheld uh, dedicated gaming machine than perhaps in the West. Um, well, sure, ev everyone has an epic world. Yes, exactly. Everyone has an hour on the train, and um, everyone just wants to play games in the room uh, when they get home. So uh, I think that dynamic and the Japanese developers were putting a lot of energy into the Vita platform, which is why it was continued to be successful in Japan. Um, and we just didn't have that kind of support here in the West to be direct about it. Last question. Who's taking the oh, last question? There's somebody down here in the front row. Yeah. Yeah, front row. Let's try front row. Here, I've got two mics. Which one? Mm, hello. Hello. Uh, I'm a student. Uh, right now, I'm doing the green video game development. And each year, we develop a, a game, a simple one. 
Um, and we are introduced to do a sort of uh, shadow, which we follow a vertical slice, then we do an alpha, and then finally a gold. I would like to know if you did a sort of the same method or followed a different one, in which is, if you could explain it, or if you followed a similar one, maybe your thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, those are some of the key milestones that we track as well in game development. You know, we look at, you know, first of all, you have to have just proof of concept, right? Is this a great idea? And you have people that look at that and interrogate that and ask questions around that. Then you need to be able to prove the technology or maybe prove the mechanics around that. And you build towards then that vertical slice, which is trying to show what, you know, 80% or 90% of what that game is gonna be and whether you can go forward from there. And then you start tracking alpha and beta and other milestones within that. And now with online gaming, there are other milestones around that, around you know, the network infrastructure and can you build out the architecture and do you have a backend that can support this going out and what's, what's your load level and all that kind of stuff. So there's probably more, more milestones than the, than the three that you just mentioned, but that's typically the same thing. But here's the great game creator. Did I miss one? I mean, if you look at it historically, uh, that model got traction in the, the 90s. And before that, um, even some big titles like SOCOM, uh, no vertical slice. Uh, and I, I have heard this second hand, but, and this was not at all uncommon if you get back right. to the 80s and the mm -hmm. early 90s, is you'd figure out every asset you needed to make in the game, right. and you'd build, you'd, you'd build the assets, and you put the assets in the game, and the game would be playable about a month before launch, and you'd ship it. Right. Uh, and uh, there were some downsides to that. It worked sometimes, it did not work many times, and so the whole model changed to, to what you're describing today. Again, that's like, that's like the two, three million dollar model. Right, where you could do it that way. Um, I don't but now I think, think it works for a lot of those because playability is quite low. If you, if you don't get to play the game for more than one month before you ship it, That's all of these things that would occur to you in natural development, if you built a vertical slice, you're, you're losing out on. And on that note, so thank you very something. much okay. for your time today. Let's have a hand for Sean. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. What, what a, a stressful...